All right. Let's get started. <clears throat> Hepatorenal syndrome. Um, the learning objectives for today are um, understand the pathophysiology of re- uh, hepatorenal syndrome, how to diagnose it, and how to manage it. And then we'll do a few cases. But first, let's start off with a case. You have a 60-year-old man who has cirrhosis. He was admitted with abdominal pain and tense ascites. After a CT with contrast, he gets a large volume paracentesis, and he, develop, he develops an AKI. Creatinine went from 0.5 to 1.6 in 24 hours. Uh, urine output is um, 40 cc's an hour. His UA is negative for protein or RBCs. Or renal ultrasound shows no hydro. Urine sodium is 20. Urine creatinine is 90. What do you think this patient has? Patrick, what do you think this patient has? ATN, so you think he has he has abdominal compartment syndrome? Okay. So always go with your first instinct. He does have ATN. Um, so he had a CT with contrast, okay? He also had tense ascites where he got paracentesis. So he can't have abdominal compartment syndrome because they got rid of the ascites that could cause abdominal compartment syndrome. It can be hepatorenal because hepatorenal is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you have to make sure you rule out everything else before you can say it's hepatorenal. It's not urinary tract obstruction because you did imaging and it didn't have any hydronephrosis on it. So this person has ATN, not hepatorenal syndrome. And classically, with hepatorenal, your urine sodium is much lower than 20. Okay? All right. So hepatorenal is basically AKI in the setting of any liver pathology, whether it's you have portal hypertension due to cirrhosis, you have liver mets, you have severe alcoholic hepatitis, any liver um, pathology with AKI. So how does that happen? Well, you have abnormalities in your liver. Do you guys remember which hormone or which cytokine helps in, um, causes the splanchnic vasodilatation that you have? Excellent. Nitric oxide. It's nitric oxide. That's the the one that's been studied the most, but there's also like TNF-alpha, endothelin, and something else. Um, But nitric oxide is what causes vasodilatation in your splanchnic vasculature. So what happens when you have um, pooling of blood in your splanchnic? vasculature. What do you think? How does your heart respond? Follow the diagram. Um, So what happens is you have decreased effective blood volume. What does that mean? That you actually have enough blood, but intravascularly, it appears that you're depleted. Okay? So when it comes to your heart, your sympathetic nervous system gets activated. So you become tachycardic, your cardiac output increases, and you have decreased peripheral resistance, okay? In the brain, because your baroreceptors detect that you have um, low blood volume, it activates ADH, which to a certain degree causes vasoconstriction in your kidneys. But what does ADH do? Excellent. You have water reabsorption, so you can become hyponatremic. In the kidneys, because the kidneys are smart for the most part, um, they detect that you have decreased perfusion. So what's going to happen? It activates your renin angio aldo system. That's a RAS system. So what happens? You have vasoconstriction, and what do you start doing? To the sodium, specifically. You start reabsorbing the sodium, okay? Um, Why does... Does anybody know why um, you don't have vasodilatation in your kidneys. Why it's everywhere. Nitric oxide also gets to your kidneys. Why does that happen? So you mean it causes vasoconstriction? But why doesn't the nitric oxide overpower that system? Does anybody know? It's because um, you have increased urinary loss of prostaglandins. What do prostaglandins do? cause vasodilatation. So what happens is when your kidneys sense that you have increased nitric oxide, that they need to vasoconstrict because they're not being perfused, they'll start just 
increasing the loss of prostaglandins in your urine. So these people have higher urinary loss of prostaglandins, okay? So that's why it doesn't affect the kidneys, but it can affect your other organs. All right. So basically what happens is after some time, you have decline, um, decline in renal perfusion, and that leads to decreased GFR, decreased sodium reabsorption, and decrease in your mean arterial blood pressure because you can no longer maintain your blood pressure. So somebody who has hepatorenal, they'll have a tendency to be hypotensive. So their means were in the 80s previously, now they're running in the 60s, okay? You have to remember that your tubular function is normal. It's working. That's why you, you're retaining the sodium. If it wasn't retaining the sodium, you'd have what? When your tubules don't work, what is it called? ATN, okay? This is not ATN. Your tubules are completely fine in this clinical setting. So there's two types of hepatorenal. There's type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is bad. Um, it usually happens uh, where your creatinine increases to 2.5 or higher, or you have a 50% decline in your creatinine clearance, or your GFR is less than 20 in less than two weeks, okay? So this will be a patient you have, probably a Jewish, um, who comes in with a creatinine of 0.5, and now their creatinine is 3 in like three days. They have decreased urine output. That's usually type 1 hepatorenal. If that's on your differential. Okay, and usually there's a precipitating factor. So they had some sort of paracentesis done, they have an infection, they have a GI bleed, something that led to hepatorenal syndrome. Then there's hepatorenal type 2 syndrome, and that you can think of it as a more indolent form, where it can look like chronic kidney disease, where you just notice their creatinine slowly creeping up, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. Now when you see them in clinic, it's 1.5 or higher, okay? Um, and this, you don't progress, you kind of just stay like 1.5, slowly progress. Um, and this is usually caused um, by refractory um, ascites. So just a quick picture form of what we talked about. Precipitating factors of hepatorenal, so you have bacterial infection, which is SVP. You have paracentesis, GI bleeding, acute alcoholic hepatitis, which again causes worsening in your re renal vasoconstriction. Uh, and then you have, um, it, which can lead to hepatorenal syndrome. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Yes, good. Um, so what's a prognosis? Well, type 1, obviously, because it's more rapidly progressing, it's worse. So within um, two weeks, you have an 80% mortality. And then if you can live up to three months, your survival is 10% of the patients will survive. Okay, so it's really, really bad. Type 1 is really bad. Type 2, survival is six months. Okay? So how do you diagnose it? Again, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So you have to make sure they haven't been exposed to anything, they don't have glomerulonephritis, they don't have any other disease before you can say it's hepatorenal. So the uh, criteria that we're going to go over, the criterion that we're going to go over, it's not um, sensitive for hepatorenal, okay? So again, you have to have AKI in the setting of lung, uh, liver pathology, and just because you have CKD does not mean you can't have hepatorenal. So you can have somebody who has CKD due to diabetes or creatinine can be two, they can also have hepatorenal as long as they have some sort of liver abnormalities, okay? So what's the diagnostic criteria? Your creatinine has to be more than 1.5 um, or your um, creatinine clearance drops to less than 40, okay? The idea is how do you differentiate between um, intravascular volume depletion and hepatorenal? That's why you give them albumin. You stop diuretics, because that promotes intravascular volume depletion, so you stop that, and you volume expand them with albumin. Usually it's 100 grams per day max for two days in a row. Okay? So if they don't respond, what does that mean? So you give somebody... 100 grams for two days, their creatinine was three, and it's still three on day three. So what does that mean? It will point more towards the paternal, because if there were intravascular volume depletion, what would, you, what would happen? You would expect it to improve with volume, absolutely. So because it doesn't improve, it points more towards hepatorenal syndrome. Again, you have to make sure they're not in shock. So these people are hypotensive. People will think they're in septic shock, cardiogenic shock or something. Make sure they're not. 
Um, it could just be the hepatorenal that's making their means drop. Um, you have to make sure they haven't been getting any nephrotoxic agents such as zinc, gentamicin, IV contrast, something, okay? They have to have a bland urine, so they shouldn't have any proteinuria, they shouldn't have any RBCs, okay? And they shouldn't have any hydro. So you make sure, again, you roulette other causes. You make sure they're not obstructed or anything. So that's the main criteria. Additional criteria is you can be oliguric, which is less than 500 cc's of urine a day. Your urine sodium can be less than 10. That's a little more specific for hepatorenal, okay? But that can also be the case if your intravascular volume depleted, okay? Um, your urine osmolality is greater than your serum osmolality, so your sodium will be 130, your urine osmolality will be high. Do you guys know why? What are you doing when you have um, decreased effective blood volume? What do you do? Retain more water and you do what? You hold on to sodium and you hold on to the water. So what are you going to pee out? Concentrated urine, the other stuff that you don't need. So you can pee out potassium, urea, glucose, whatever it is to get your osmol urine osmolality higher. Okay? Um, your urine RBCs should be less than 50, so it shouldn't look like a GN picture. You shouldn't have a gram of proteinuria. You shouldn't have 100 RBCs with CAS. That is not hepatorenal, okay? And your urine sodium can, I'm sorry, your serum sodium can be less than 130, but again, you don't have to have hyponatremia. It can be normal. All right, what is a problem? I'm so sorry. Uh, what is a problem with estimating your GFR using creat bumin and creatinine in your um, cirrhotics? What's the problem? Excellent. So your cirrhotics are naturally, they just have decreased muscle mass, and BUN and creatinine are a measure, surrogate measure of your muscle mass. So if you have decreased muscle, you're going to have decreased creatinine and BUN. So it's very common to see your cirrhotics with a BUN of 8, 10, creatinine of 0.5, for them that's normal. In a normal person, that'd be equivalent to a creatinine of 1 or 1.5, okay? So what happens is you guys, not you guys, but people tend to miss AKI because their creatinine will go from 0.5 to 0.8, but you'll be like, oh, it's normal creatinine. But for that person, that was a drop in their GFR, a huge drop, because they don't have a lot of muscle mass. Um, so uh, you have to be cognizant of that. So because their creatinine is 1.5 now, for like a normal person, that would be a creatinine of, I don't know, 2 or 3. But for them, it's lower. Does that make sense? So you just have to, be, you just have to remember that just because their creatinine is 0.8 doesn't mean that's normal. It may just be high for that cirrhotic. Other differentials you always have to remember for somebody who has AKI with liver disease, obviously hepatorenal, you have to think about ATN, you have to think about prerenal azotemia. Oh, Lord. Um, you have to think about interstitial nephritis, if they've been exposed to any uh, nephrotoxic agents. You also have to think about glomerular disease. So like we talked about last week, if you guys remember, um, IgA nephropathy can give you secondary, um, sorry, liver disease can give you secondary IgA nephropathy. Cryo, if you have a history of hepatitis C and AKI. Uh, MPGN with any type of hepatitis um, can give you um, AKI. And membranous nephropathy in the setting of hepatitis can also give you AKI. Okay? So you always have to think about these differentials. You don't just jump to hepatorenal just because somebody has um, decompensated liver failure with AKI. So how do you treat these people? What's the number one treatment in somebody who has hepatorenal, specifically hepatorenal type 1? Liver transplant. You have to transplant them, okay? That's the number one treatment. If while we're waiting for a liver transplant, we can give them vasoconstrictors. And we'll go over those later. And then you can do TIPS and um, renal replacement therapy. So renal trans... Okay sorry, liver transplant, um, it's very beneficial, especially in type 1, okay? Um, in people who didn't um, receive a liver transplant, you don't dialyze these people because dialysis is a bridge to transplant, okay? So if you've said that this person was drinking a week ago, they're not a candidate for uh, liver transplant, I wouldn't even offer them dialysis. That's not even something I would mention, Okay? So while you're waiting for a liver transplant, say it's going to take two weeks. 
I'll just pretend. So what can you put them on? Well, you can put them on vasoconstrictors. What is terlipressin? If you guys can read. It's a vasopressin analog. Um, it's usually studied in Europe. So what they did is they gave albumin and terlipressin. And what it showed is probably better than the octreotide, albumin, and midodrine that we put them on here. Okay? Why is that? Anybody know? No? Okay. Um, I don't know. That's a great question. It hasn't been answered yet. Um, so what I do want you guys to remember is just because you put them on vasoconstrictors doesn't mean it's going to improve their mortality. They have to have a liver transplant. It's just a short-term solution, okay? A long-term solution is liver transplant. So um, why don't we have terlipressin here? Does anybody know? Why don't we use it in the ICU? Why is it only in Europe that we use it? I'm sorry? Good. Why is it not approved? <laughs> of what? What does it cause? Kavitha, do you know? So it causes ischemia. So it can give you MIs. It can have gut ischemia. So the FDA decided that we're too good for that. So we don't give terlipressin. Here in the ICU, if the patient's in the ICU, you give them um, either levofed with albumin or vasopressin with albumin. Okay, and the idea is you get their blood pressure higher, so you get their blood pressure at least 20 points above their mean. So if they're at 60, you titrate up the levofed to get their means in the 80s, okay? Um, and again, this is in the setting of stopping diuretics, okay? Um, also, if they're on the floor, you can give them octreotide, midodrine, and albumin. What is octreotide and midodrine? What do they do? What topic are we on? Vasoconstrictors, so they just vasoconstrict. So they should bring your blood pressure higher. Again, you titrate up these medications to attain the blood pressure that you want. So renal replacement therapy. What I want you guys to remember is, again, this is a bridge to transplant. Do not offer a person dialysis if they are not going to get transplant. If the AKI is due to something else, say you thought it was due to GN, fine. Then I'll dialyze them. But if you think it's hepatorenal, they're not a transplant candidate, you do not offer them dialysis, okay? All right, and again, you dialyze for your AEIOUs. Do you remember your AEIOUs? Your A is, your E is such as hyperkalemia, hypercalcemia, excellent. O is, I is, okay, good, so ingestion, and then U is, and what type of uremic symptoms will this person have? Alter mental status, but that could be from your liver disease. What else do you have? Asterixis, that could be from your liver disease. Pericarditis, excellent. So what will you hear on physical exam? A friction rub. What else do you see? Um, what else are some uremic symptoms? platelet dysfunction, so they'll have bleeding issues, okay? Good. So then in this person, you can dialyze them if they meet criteria for dialysis. So when do you offer somebody tips? I'll tell you, on your exam, it's never the first answer, okay? It's after you've tried everything else, that's when you offer them tips, okay? And what it does, it reduces the portal pressure, suppression of your hepatorenal reflux, and improvement of circulation. Um, so what it has shown is it can make your renal function better, but it will never come back down to normal, okay? So maybe it helps a little bit. So again, that's why we don't offer it as a first-line therapy, okay? Because there's not much benefit in it. So what are some complications you see with TIPS? You have increased incidence of hepatic encephalopathy. You have bleeding issues. Because they were exposed to contrast while they were getting the TIPS procedure, it can make your creatinine worse, okay? Um, and you have worsening of your liver function. Does someone have a question? No? All right, let's do some questions then. You have a 32-year-old man with cirrhosis due to autoimmune hepatitis. He's admitted to the hospital with SBP. Um, his, he's hemodynamically stable. He's not on any diuretics. He doesn't take any NSAIDs. He is treated with IV antibiotics. He's treated with IV fluids. He's given IV albumin on admission as well. At the time of admission, his creatinine was 1.2, which is high for a person 
with cirrhosis, right? Okay. On day five, his creatinine increases to 4.1, and he's aneuric. What are your differential diagnosis sees in this person? I'm sorry? Excellent. ATN, what else? Hepaterenal, excellent. What else? What is? Excellent. AIN, one more. It, it, it could be obstruction. Okay, we'll do that. What else? What happens before you progress to ischemic ATN? What can you have? Pre-renal azotemia. Okay, so your differentials. You guys are very smart. Um, Pre-renal azotemia, hepatorenal, ATN, AIN, and you're right. It could be post-obstructive as well. Cool. So which of the following is true? Does he have hepatorenal type 2 and needs to be evaluated for a liver and kidney transplant? He has type 1 and should be treated with albumin, octreotide, and midodrine as a bridge to transplant. After a liver transplant, his renal function is unlikely to fully recover. Uh, pharmaceutical management involves vasodilator therapy with the goal of improving renal perfusion. Let's just go back to the case real quick. So his creatinine went from 1.2 to 4.1. What's the criteria for hepatorenal type 2? I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. More than 1.5. Over weeks, months, years. What's the criteria for hepatorenal type 1? Excellent. So your creatinine is more than 2.5 or your GFR drops to less than 20 in a matter of how long? Two weeks. So this person's creatinine went from 1.2 to 4.1 in five days. What's that? Is it type 2? No. <clears throat> the time is very short, so it's probably hepatorenal type 1. Okay? So we can automatically say it's not hepatorenal type 2. A is ruled out. Uh, type 1, how do you treat them? If he was on the floor, you'd give him albumin, midodrine, octreotide. If they were in the ICU, you would give them excellent. Um, after transplant, does your renal function get better, or does it stay bad? So hepatorenal is, for the most part, reversible. So when you transplant them, their creatinine should get back down to normal. Okay? Um, so do you give them vaso? dilator therapy or do you give them vasoconstrictor? You give them vasoconstrictor therapy. So the correct answer here is B. Does that make sense? Okay. Next, you have a 54-year-old man with end-stage liver disease from alcoholic cirrhosis who presents to the ER complaining of decreased urine output and swelling in his lower extremities. His disease is complicated by ascites and hepatic encephalopathy in the past. Um, his creatinine on admission is 1.7. It was a 1.1 a month ago. There are no new medication changes um, and no recent procedures performed. A diagnostic paracentesis is performed and is negative for any infection. He's admitted to the hospital for further management and initiated an al on albumin. Two days later, his creatinine is, uh, goes up to 3.24, and he's oliguric. So that means he's, his urine output is less than 500 cc's an hour, uh, a day. Which of the following is the most definitive treatment for this patient's condition? What type of, so let's say you've ruled out everything else, you think it's hepatorenal. What type of hepatorenal is it? And what would you do? Transplant, you transplant these people. Um, he can stop alcohol use, that's fine, but that's not definitive therapy. Um, you never, I have never done a peritoneal venous shunt. Uh, TIPS is always the last solution before uh, you have to do everything else before you do TIPS. Liver transplant and hemodialysis, again, is a bridge to transplant. So if he meets criteria, then you dialyze him. Otherwise, you can just watch him. Next, you have a 48-year-old man with cirrhosis is emitted with SVP. Despite antibiotic therapy and volume expansion with albumin, he develops AKI. His, his creatinine goes from 0 0.7 to 1.6. His physician starts him on terlipressin. Which of the following is the most, is the likeliest outcome of terlipressin um, therapy in this patient with hepatorenal syndrome?
Okay, let's go through them. Can terlipressin make your renal function better with albumin? Okay. Can it make um, hepatic encephalopathy worse? Can it cause hep- hepatic encephalopathy? Th- Whoa. Can it cause hepatic encephalopathy? No. Which procedure that we went over gives you worsening tips exactly? Um, can you have decreased variceal um, GI bleeding? Because it can lead to what? Causes decreased bleeding, but it can do what? Ischemia. Good. Can it improve your cardiac function? No. Can it improve platelet function? No. So it would be decreased variceal bleeding. However, it can give you ischemia. Okay? So you have to be cognizant of that. I think this is our last question. Um, you have a 54-year-old man who was hospitalized three days ago following um, hematemesis episode. He's now being evaluated for 24 hours of oliguria. His past medical history includes uh, coronary artery disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, hepatitis C. Um, he denies any cigarette use but says he still drinks, um, and he has a history of IV drug abuse 10 years ago. Um, his temperature is okay. His blood pressure is 110 over 65. His pulse is 75. Respiratory rate is okay. On physical exam, is just significant for severe ascites and abdominal tenderness. Um, he has 2-plus pitting edema. His UA shows 50-plus RBCs, trace proteinuria. His creatinine is 5.14 and does not improve with diuresis. Fluid challenge of 500 cc's of albumin over several hours fails to improve urine output. What is the most likely diagnosis? What have we been talking about? Mm-hmm. What's the most likely diagnosis? Hepatorenal? Do you guys agree? Okay. Okay. Okay, so what is it? MPGM. Excellent. So you start thinking, again, it goes back to your UA. That's when it's important. It should be a very bland urine just because he has trace proteinuria, but he has a lot of RBCs, okay? Um, And if you guys remember from last week, um, the different types of GNs that occur in the setting of hepatitis C. So if you have somebody with hepatitis C, um, AKI, they have um, a rash on their legs, what do you have? Cryo, excellent. And when you look at cryo under the microscope, it looks like MPGN, but you have to stain for the cryo, okay? So it's MPGN. Very good. Do you guys have any questions? Awesome.